I know that in the past we stuck to the whole having two missions in the past, such as Viking and, and Spirit and Opportunity. Why did, why, why did they choose not to do that with MSL? Well, because of the size and cost of the mission. Now, it is a gamble. Uh, and I have to say that uh, when this was proposed, I thought this was a deviation from correct principles. Uh, I thought the plan of sending multiples of medium-sized rovers is a better plan than sending one large rover. Now, of course, if it succeeds, uh, this mission will be a terrific success. But they are putting all the eggs in one basket. Why is it so important that we need to explore Mars, and especially have human exploration of Mars? Why should humans go to Mars? As far as I see it, there's three reasons. For the science, for the challenge, and for the future. Okay. First of all, there is the science. Mars was once a warm and wet planet, a place where life could have developed in principle. Okay. If we can go to Mars and really explore it and find fossils, we'll have proven that the development of life from chemistry is uh, not unique to the Earth, but a general principle of natural science. And since we now know that there are thousands of solar systems in our galaxy, probably billions, and every star has a correct distance near or far depending upon uh, the brightness of the star where you have the right temperatures for liquid water, if life originated on two out of two planets, it means it's a general phenomena and it means life is everywhere. And since the entire history of life on Earth is one of development, from simpler forms to more complex forms, manifesting greater capacity for activity and intelligence and ever more rapid evolution, if life is everywhere, it means intelligence and civilization is everywhere. This is really worth finding out. Uh, on the other hand, if you go to Mars with human explorers and you do not find any evidence of past life on the surface, then you reach a negative conclusion and that the, you must conclude that the origin of life is not simply a natural process that emerges uh, probabilistically from chemistry and water and sunlight and this and that, uh, but that there's a, an element of freak chance, this one in 10 to the 124th power that the DNA molecule will come together and make a spiral and do this and that and multiply, it, which is what some other people think. Okay, and, uh, and that's also we're finding out. That would mean we're alone. Okay, now, furthermore, if we can go to Mars and set up drilling rigs and reach down into the subsurface, okay, where there is liquid water today, almost certainly, and bring it up, there could be life in that water now. In other words, if there was ever life on Mars, the place where it could still abide is in the uh, underground water, where there's plenty of life in the Earth's groundwater. Uh, and we could get samples, look at it, see what biochemistry it has. Does it have the same biochemistry as Earth life, or is it something different? All Earth life, from bacteria to people, has the same biochemistry. We all use RNA and DNA, the same amino acids, the works. We've got different design, but the bricks are the same. Does it have to be that way? Could it be different? In other words, is life as we know it on Earth the pattern for what life is, or are we just one example drawn from a much faster tapestry of possibilities. This is really worth finding out. Only human explorers are going to find this out. Uh, you know, uh, even the fossil hunting. You know, I, I, I live in Colorado. This is dinosaur heaven. All the dinosaurs went to Colorado to die. Okay, this is where they discovered Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops and all the famous dinosaurs. Okay, you could land a hundred spirit and opportunity rovers in the Rocky Mountains. You could land a thousand of them and you would never find a dinosaur fossil. It takes trained paleontologists, real rock hounds, going there, scrambling over things, sniffing out clues, digging, pickaxing, doing delicate work, carefully peeling open shales sideways in order to find out what's between the pages of rocks that are pasted together. That's what's needed to find dinosaur fossils. Okay, these robotic rovers, not even big ones like Curiosity, never be able to do it. Okay, and then drilling to bring up water, doing biochemical research on Mars, this is far beyond the ability of robotic rovers. Real explorers have got to go to Mars. Secondly, there's the challenge. 
I think that civilizations are like people. We grow when we challenge ourselves. We stagnate when we do not. And a Humans to Mars program would be a tremendous bracing challenge for our society, especially for the youth. It would say to every young person, learn your science and you could be an explorer of new worlds. Okay? And out of that challenge, we'd get millions of scientists, engineers, inventors, doctors, medical researchers, technological entrepreneurs. Okay? These are the kinds of people that drive society forward. These are the kinds of people that create new industries, new wealth, okay? that advance our national defense that advance our, our, our public welfare. Okay. We got paid over many times from Apollo, not from the Teflon, okay, but from the science and engineering graduates. We doubled the number of science graduates in this country during Apollo at every level, high school, college, PhD. Okay. And, and who were the technological entrepreneurs who created Silicon Valley in the 1990s, the 40-year-old geeks, okay, a 12-year-old little boy mad scientist of the 1960s? Okay, guys like me, except more successful. Okay, and uh, going around making rocket fuel in the basement, scaring the shit out of their parents. Okay, who then in their forties go and, and and create this computer revolution. Okay, and while NASA likes to say that you know, oh, on the space station we will find new medical cures. Well, I doubt it. I doubt that the team that finds the cure to AIDS will find it on the space station. But I guarantee you that the team that finds the cures to AIDS will include scientists that became scientists because they were inspired by Apollo. Okay. So that's the second reason. And finally, there is the future. If we do what we can do in our time, which is establish that first little Plymouth Rock foothold on Mars, then 200 years from now, there will be new branches of human civilization on Mars. And 500 years from now, there will be new branches of human civilization, not only on Mars and elsewhere in this solar system, but in hundreds of other solar systems in this wing of the galaxy. Okay. And when they look back at this time, what will they consider that is important about this time? Will they care who won in Iraq or Afghanistan? Will they even know what Iraq was? No. No more than anyone today knows who was ruling Iraq 500 years ago. Okay. You ask any American today what happened in the year 1492, and they won't tell you about anything that happened in Iraq. Okay. They will tell you Christopher Columbus set sail. And he did. Well, Guess what? Other important things, or so it seemed, at the time happened in 1492. In 1492, the Borgias took over the papacy, the most powerful institution in the Western world. In 1492, Lorenzo de' Medici died. In 1492, England and France signed a peace treaty. Nobody but history buffs knows those facts. Everybody knows about Columbus. Everybody knows about Isabella because she sponsored Columbus. How many people could name who was Queen of Spain after Isabella? Okay. Um, Okay. The, even though that Queen of Spain ruled a more powerful country than Isabella did precisely because of Columbus. Uh, no. Okay. Isabella is significant because Columbus. Columbus is what was important. Columbus made our world possible. Well, those people 500 years from now, looking back at this time, are not going to give a damn about who was in and who was out and who won here and who won there. But what we did to make their civilizations possible, that will matter. This time will be remembered by the future because this is when we first set sail for other worlds.